Back by popular demand, we have a little segment with a hold on Liv, with a fan favorite guest, my daughter, Liv. Say hi, Liv. Hi, Liv. Well, <laughs> how old are you? Three. You're three. Yeah. Where do you live? Tennessee. <laughs> yeah. What's your favorite movie? A uh, Mickey Mouse. Mickey Mouse, but you also like who are you playing with right now? Ariel. 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 What's your favorite song from Ariel? Uh. Is it part of your world? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah? Are you having a good day? Yeah. What are you going to do today? A mini puzzle. You want to do a mini puzzle? That's a good idea. I like that. Okay. You want to say bye to the people? Bye, people. Good job. Welcome back to the Kennedy Dynasty Podcast. I'm your host, Allison, and today I've got a long-awaited episode for you I'm excited about. Before we get started, though, let's do our In the News segment. Big news story of the past seven days... In his new role as U.S. Special Envoy to Northern Ireland, Joe Kennedy III has released a video on his social media platforms affirming his commitments to deepening trade and investments between the U.S. and Northern Ireland and to ensuring that Northern Ireland fulfills its potential as a place to visit, study, and do business. So I'm going to insert a little clip of his clip that he posted here. Hi, everybody. I'm Joe Kennedy, and I'm honored to serve as the United States Special Envoy to Northern Ireland for Economic Affairs. My appointment as Envoy comes at an important milestone in our shared history as we approach the 25th anniversary of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. We can reflect on how political progress has provided the necessary conditions for economic prosperity. Since 1998, Northern Ireland's growth in foreign direct investment has been remarkable. Improved political conditions have allowed our two-way trade to flourish. Now, we must continue the work to create opportunities for all in our future. The United States' commitment to a secure and prosperous Northern Ireland remains as strong as ever. I firmly believe that the next 25 years will be a time of even more growth and prosperity. Our goals are simple. We will capitalize on opportunities that deepen trade and investment between the United States and Northern Ireland. We will work to strengthen the people-to-people ties that have been fostered over so many years and will champion together Northern Ireland's compelling potential as a place to visit, a place to study, and a place to do business. During my first weeks in this role, I've spoken to a range of leaders, experts, and citizens who have a stake in Northern Ireland's economic future. I look forward to continuing these discussions. I am thrilled, honored, and humbled to be part of our shared history and to take on this exciting opportunity. Next up, our inspiring clip of the week. One of the inspiring notes. In honor of January 20th, just being a few days ago, here is a clip of President Kennedy's inaugural address. In the long history of the world, only a few generations have been granted the role of defending freedom in its hour of maximum danger. I do not shrink from this responsibility. I welcome it. I do not believe that any of us would exchange places with any other people or any other generation. The energy, the faith, the devotion which we bring to this endeavor will light our country and all who serve it. And the glow from that fire can truly light the world. And so, my fellow Americans, ask not what your country can do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. My fellow citizens of the world, ask not what America will do for you, but what together we can do for the freedom of man. Finally, whether you are citizens of America or citizens of the world, ask of us here the same high standards of strength and sacrifice which we ask of you. With a good conscience, our only sure reward 
with history the final judge of our deeds, let us go forth to lead the land we love, asking his blessing and his help, but knowing that here on earth, God's work must truly be our own. And our recommendation segment. Of course, then we would uh, recommend it. Because of this episode's subject, I am recommending Lim Billings' oral history interview with the JFK Library. I will put a direct link in the description of this episode to listen to it. Let's get to the episode. So there is a lot of fascination around Lim Billings, who is JFK's lifelong best friend since they were like teenagers. He's a really interesting guy, and their friendship is very interesting. And I've been meaning to cover or do an episode on him for a while, and... It just kept getting pushed and whatnot, but now is the time, and I'm excited to talk about him. So this will be a, a kind of brief overview of his life, as always, because of my format. I will not be able to include every single point of his entire life, so make sure that you go research yourself and send me anything you find. Also, I'm the kind of person that's reading about 50 books at one time. I think you guys know that about me. I listen to audiobooks. I'm reading books. I am always have another book that I'm reading on the side because uh, I'm going to interview someone about their books. So I have a bunch going at once. So I am in the process of reading Jack and Lim. And uh, it's great so far, <laughs> but I have not finished it. So I, I mean, I, I, I recommend it, but I haven't finished it totally for myself. So that's something on my to-do list for sure. But it's highly recommended by a lot of people in my DMs and stuff. So um, get you a copy if you want to learn more about Lim. Our sources today are Belfast Telegraph, JFK Library, People.com, New York Times, Princeton EDU, and that's it. So let's get started. Kirk Lemoyne Billings, more commonly known as Lim Billings, was born in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1916. Lim first met Jack at Choate School in 1933 when the pair were working together on the school's yearbook. Jack and Lim were both really disillusioned with the tradition and rigidity of Choate School, and so the two created an informal club called the Muckers to pull pranks and break school rules. Though Lim didn't really think particularly highly of Choate School, he chose to retake his senior year so that he could graduate with Jack. They were truly the best of friends. In the summer of 1937, Jack and Lim embarked upon a three-month long trip across Western Europe, which signed me up. What a dreamy trip that had to be. Their adventures included visits to Carcassonne, France, Pisa, Italy, and Nuremberg in Germany, where they bought a dachshund named Dunker, even though JFK was allergic to dogs, which I would just like to say, I am a dachshund owner. What's a dachshund owner? Always a dachshund owner. I've had them since I was a child, and um, my current dachshund, his name is Sir Henry, and he is nine years old, fun fact. So I've always loved the picture of JFK with Dunker. Anyway, continuing the theme of travel and adventure, Lim would go on to travel around Latin America with Bobby 10 years later. So he was really, really, really close to the Kennedy family, as we'll talk about in just a minute. During World War II, Lim served in the Ambulance Corps of the American Field Service in North Africa, and then in the U.S. Naval Reserve in the South Pacific. After being discharged from the U.S. Navy in 1946, Lim attended Harvard Graduate School of Business, where he received his MBA. And he had already graduated from Princeton, where he had studied art and architecture. During his studies, he would travel to Cambridge and NYC most weekends to meet Jack. Very well educated, as you can see. JFK was actually buried with a gift from Lim, a whale's tooth scrimshaw, which is a testament to just how close they were that he was able to leave an item with the President of the United States. Lim is said to have been deeply depressed after Jack was assassinated, and he even turned to drugs. He was even described as the saddest of all the Kennedy widows. But Lim wasn't just Jack's friend. He was also particularly close to Kick and Bobby, at whose funeral he was a pallbearer, and he even remained in contact with Bobby's children after his death. He was always invited to Thanksgivings and Christmas dinners. And Teddy once even said that he didn't realize that Lim wasn't his brother until he was like three years old. As he had been at Jack and Jackie's wedding in 1953, he was an usher in Gene Kennedy's wedding to Stephen Smith. Rose Kennedy even referred to him as being part of our family in her autobiography. And Joe Kennedy Sr. referred to him as my second son. Lim was close to both Jack and Jackie. During Jack's presidency, he spent every weekend with the first couple, vacation with them, traveled with them to presidential engagements, and he even had his own room at the White House, which this was actually much to the dismay of Jackie, who felt that her husband spent too much time with Lim. Some people at the White House even thought that Lim was a part of the Secret Service because of his close proximity to Jack at all times. He was colloquially referred to as first friend. 
which I just love. So I'm going to insert a clip here of a phone call that I found between Jack and Lim during the White House years. Ms. Lincoln, Mr. Lim Billings. Sure. Ma'am? Hello. Ma'am? Hello? Where are you? Oh, hi. I'm, uh, I missed my damn plane, so I'm going to have to shoot up to Boston and back to Boston. Oh, I see. Well, I'm still, doesn't look like I may be able to go there. Or go at all? That's right. Oh, I better not go until you, until you know. Okay, you're in, uh, just leave your message where we can. Now. When do you think you'd know or do you, you don't know? Well, it looks like uh, it would be sometime. Why don't you go back into New York? All right. And then I'll be in touch with you. Okay, good. Because uh, you can always come up later. Okay, guys, uh, I guess it's not going too well, huh? Well, yeah. I suppose you're because of the business. Yeah. Okay, well, I'll see you later. Okay, fine. Now, unlike most of JFK's friends, Lim didn't have a job with the Kennedy administration, though he was active during both his and Bobby's political campaigns. He was offered the roles of Director of the Peace Corps, U.S. Ambassador to Denmark, and Director of the U.S. Travel Service, but he declined as he did not want his friendship with Jack to become a professional relationship. You know what they always say, don't work with your friends. I don't know if that's true or not. I mean, I know the saying's true, but I don't know if it, like, I work with some of my friends and I think it's great, so, but they say, don't work with your friends. I don't know. Maybe Lim believed in that. Now, the one position that Lim did accept during JFK's presidency was member of the Board of Trustees for the National Culture Center, now the JFK Center for the Performing Arts, which really complemented his fascination with art and culture. He was also a trustee for the Kennedy Library at Harvard University. Now, I love this facet about Lim because I love marketing and advertising, but he enjoyed a successful career in advertising and marketing. He worked for Coca-Cola, Emerson Drug Company, and Lennon and Newell. It makes me think Mad Men, which it's time for me to have another Mad Men viewing. Just saying, I don't think you can watch Mad Men enough. It's a whole vibe. Lim was gay at a time whereby homosexuality was illegal in the U.S. However, it was an open secret, but neither he nor his family really discussed the matter often. Lim never married, and he even said that Jack may have been the reason I never got married, questioning, do you think I would have had a better life having had the best friend anybody ever had or having been married? And he was rumored to have had romantic feelings for JFK. There were concerns among White House staff that JFK's rumored sexual relationship with Lim would be used as blackmail materials by the Soviets. And let's keep in mind, Jack didn't care. Lim was one of his best friends in the world, and he didn't care about all the rumors or anything to do with it. They were close. Which I feel like this really speaks volumes for a time that was so repressive of the gay community. I think that Jack not caring what anybody said about his friendship really speaks volumes to who he was. Sadly, Lim died in his sleep from a heart attack in 1981, and this was at the age of 65. I would encourage going and doing a Google search on Lim Billings, learning a little more for yourself, but also looking through photos of him with the Kennedy family, and clearly he was just such a huge part of their lives, and they were a huge part of his, and it really is a beautiful friendship. That's all I've got for you today. I hope you enjoyed this episode on Lim Billings. I will talk about him, and I have talked about him a lot because he was around all the time. So he will pop up more in our episode. So I'm glad to have given an overview of who he was and how important he was to the Kennedy family. Next week, I will have an interview coming out with an author about her book. So I'm excited about sharing that one with you. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss when new episodes are available. I feel like I sound like a broken record saying that every time, but I really mean it. Share the podcast with your friends and family. That would be great. And also, of course, please, please, please leave a five-star review and also write a positive review on Apple Podcasts because that helps me so, so very much. Have a great week, and I'll talk to you next week. Come on and vote for Kennedy. Vote for Kennedy. Keep America strong. Kennedy, he just keeps rolling up.